Welcome back to our program, Hollywood Structured. As some of you already know, our program is designed to help the young people interested in entering the entertainment field, maybe nightclub work, theater, television, or film. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people to help them understand their wants, their needs, and the traps or the pitfall that they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. As usual, we have a special guest, someone who started wanting to be an anthropologist, an archaeologist, then put a nose in books and wanted to be a writer, wanted to be in production. However, along the way, she had to make a living, and somebody suggested, why don't you study law? And she decided, okay, I'll study law. I mean, this is probably the end of my producing career. However, she has come full turn. She is now a producer and an entertainment lawyer. Her name is Jonna Levine. Hello, Jonna. Lillian. Before, however, Jonna shares her expertise with us, I would like to talk to you today about one word. That's right. Just one word. The word which I think has been bandied around too much. Some people attach a mystical, mysterious connotation to it. Um, some of you probably know the origin of the word, and some of you do not. So I will explain. However, before I do that, I have a question for all of you out there. How many times have you heard or seen or read or even said yourself, that person has talent, that person has no talent. Yes, you're right. The word I want to talk to you about today is talent. Now, I admit that some people have less inhibitions than others. You can say to somebody, some young actor starting, I want you to get a very angry and say, yes, okay, and they get very angry on the spur of the moment. You can say to the same actor, I want you to cry right now. And they would say, all right, if you want me to. However, you can say to some people who are starting, I want you to do the same thing. And they can't. They have more inhibition. They cannot let their emotions go out. So part of it, that talent that everybody talks about, is technique. I admit that some children are born geniuses. However, even geniuses have to have discipline. Even geniuses have to practice. Even geniuses have to have patience. Why not you? Let me give you the origin of the word tunnel. It comes from the Greek. It was a measure of money, and it was also a stone that weighed approximately 30 pounds which the merchant used to use to trade with each other. So through the ages, through the manipulation of language, it became a sort of a god-like word, mystical word, as I was referring to earlier. But all it means, really, is to have weight in the profession in which you are entering. Maybe sports, maybe entertainment field, maybe any other field. It is what you bring to your job. Now, I'm going to dare you to do a little neat trick. If you have a scale at home, take about six pieces of paper and on one of them write, study, and put it on this side of the scale. Then take the other piece of paper and on it write the word prepare, put it on the same side of the scale. Then on the next piece of paper, write the word practice. Then you write the word discipline, again, putting it on the same side. Then you write the word persevere. And finally, the word patience. Now, what is happening to the scale? The scale is now tipping in your favor. Nothing mystical about it. It's just work. 
And if you do that, if you practice those six terms that I have used, maybe someday someone will write about you or will say about you, you have talent. You have weight in the profession you have chosen. All right? Try it. Now, I would like to open the debate to someone who has weight in her profession, <laughs> uh. a great deal of weight. John, I want to start with some of the young people out there, or some of the parents, think that maybe their children don't have a chance because they are first-generation American. Now, you are first-generation American, am I right? Oh, yes, indeed. Where were you born, and where did your parents come from? I was born in New York City, in Manhattan, lying in hospital. And prior to that, my parents had emigrated from Russia, from the Ukraine, the south of Russia. I must say that in my childhood in New York, everybody was first generation, certainly everybody I encountered. Now, when, when you were in school, did your family speak uh, Russian, or did they no, my, speak I American English? As a matter of fact, that's something very norm for the time. My parents occasionally spoke Russian to each other, not frequently. They spoke Yiddish in my household a good part of the time. I, however, was insistent about the fact that they speak English to me. I learned to understand Yiddish because I knew what they were saying to me, but I never learned to speak it because I never replied that way. I regret it now. I see. Now, you are, you are here, your parents are immigrants, and you don't have very much money, I gather, at the time. How did you acquire your thirst, your thirst for reading, for knowledge? I don't know whether it is acquired or seems a logical outgrowth of what you want in life. And from a very, very early age, what I wanted was what contact with the entire world. Reading was the way to do it. There's a whole world out there. I knew about other places, other people, and God knows other situations through books. I loved reading more than anything else. How did you get all those books? Uh, I'm a depression baby. There was no money to buy them. There really were no books in the house, or no own books in the house. You went to the library. You went to the library every other day in my early childhood. You were only allowed two books or four books at different intervals. All of those books, they came and went incessantly, and they were all from the public library. A constant range of them. And I fell in love with different libraries. You know, this was the place where I could get a whole bunch of the things I wanted. But the fact remains that the library was a second home. The library is where it all was. Did your parent encourage you? Yes, or on a whole. could not stop you? <laughs> you couldn't stop me. And of course, parents are interested in a whole series of things. You can imagine, you know, go out and play in the fresh air. No, I want to stay here and read. Or clean up your room, or you have chores to do. No, I avoided those so I could stay there and read. Do your homework later on. And I avoided that so I could keep reading. You know, a lack of proportion even in that area is not a good thing. I read too much, perhaps, and did the other things I should have done too little. Did you, were you a good student in school? Yes, I was. You were a good student. Yeah, that was another, you know, outgrowth of the reading. You know, there was a world out there. In everything except, well, algebra eventually, even earlier, arithmetic. Long division is still a nightmare. <laughs> so, sure. All right. Let me ask you the next question, which is, now you're in school, and you're a good student. What do you aspire to be, or don't you know then? Obviously, it changed very often, because I loved those books. I wanted to be a writer. When I got a bit older and more sophisticated, I found that there was a world of, of say, social sciences, and I wanted to be an anthropologist, an archaeologist, a paleontologist. This changed from time to time. And there was a time in my early, very early adolescence, before 12 even, I fell in love with the theater because I fell in love with plays. I learned, I encountered a play, I found that I adored reading plays, so I read plays. And when you read plays, it means you're in contact with the theater. So for a long time thereafter, what I was going to do was somehow work in the theater. And I thought about the legitimate theater, 
the Broadway theater. I was a New Yorker. It was there and available, though I didn't see my first play until I was 14. My brother took me for my 14th birthday, Life with Father, I remember. Prior to that, however, I had even gone to try out for a part, try out for a road company of junior miss. I read about it in the newspaper, but I did it not because I was an actress or wanted to be an actress, but I wanted to see the inside of a theater. And that's the first time I ever did see the inside of a theater. Are you sure you were never, never, never tempted to be an actress? <sighs> no, I suppose that's not quite true. I think like every other person, I wanted to be an actress to be celebrated, to be a movie star, and to wear all those beautiful clothes and, you know, and look that wonderful. Uh, but it's not something I ever took seriously as I matured. I don't have a lack of inhibition you were speaking of. I was always um, removed or, or reserved, and I had trouble communicating with, uh, in that form, you know, as, a, as somebody on stage dealing with an entire audience. Interesting, in stock, I had to act, of course, because it was a small company. I was stage managing. But every once in a while, they needed an ingenue or an extra ingenue, and I would have a small part. I was not good, and I recognized <laughs> that about myself. I never let loose. I see. All right, so now you have done some stock, and you, are, you graduated from college? Well, I actually left shortly before I graduated and then continued on to law school. You could do it if you had the right credits, the right courses, and uh, pass the right tests at that time. Now, so why did you choose law school? I was working in theater and had been for about two years after college, and I mm -hmm. found myself one season in a very bad way. Uh, no job. I took a part-time job may, at that may point. May I ask yes. one thing? While you were in school, did you have a job? to sustain you? Did you have a part-time job? Well, for part of the time, I worked part-time while I was mm -hmm. in school, generally doing secretarial things. I had gone to secretarial school on a scholarship when I was 16, immediately upon graduation from high school. To this day, I draft in shorthand. Oh, really? Yeah. That's how I do my contracts. I sit there. It's much faster. I took all my notes in law school with shorthand. Everything you learn turns out to be useful somewhere along the line, and I knew how to write in shorthand. And I'm still an expert typist, though I have trouble with my word processors. <laughs> um, however, it was a bad season. You know, I didn't have a directorial job, I didn't, or an assistant to a director, director job, and I didn't have an assistant stage manager job. Um, it was tight, and I took a part-time job as a secretary to an attorney an entertainment attorney in New York, and found that I was interested in both, you know, in that aspect of what he was doing. The law in itself was fascinating, and decided at that point that it might be wise to go to law school. It was a very untoward idea then. I was the only woman in law school when I entered, and if I remember correctly, at that point in the 50s, there were something like 2,000 women lawyers in the country. Well, there are now 2,000 women lawyers in the graduating class of any law school in the country each year. Uh, but at the time, it was an oddity. Nonetheless, it struck me as an interesting idea, and I pursued it. How long did you, did you study before you graduated? Uh, well, I was able to do law school in two years. It generally takes three. We did it in two because this particular law school had a three-semester-a-year situation Ooh. or schedule, and you could. You literally had a weekend off between terms and went right on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I graduated uh, after two years, took the bar, found myself an attorney in New York City. Now, did you get a job as an attorney? <clears throat> oh, yes, indeed. What happens with attorneys, and it's interesting, is frequently they begin practicing law in an area they're familiar with or that they have a particular affinity for. In my particular case, the only thing I had background in was the theater. And so it was not strange that the only serious offers I got, and the only people who were really interested in me, were those attorneys who dealt with, who dealt with entertainment things. I got a job with a small law firm, eventually, 
that was predicated upon two things. I could do my own typing, and they didn't have the space or the money for a secretary for me. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of indignity for women which wouldn't occur today, but did very much exist then. In other words, even though you were a lawyer, you were considered sub? Well, let us say that I had to accept that sub situation in order to practice. I did both. I was certainly a lawyer, and I handled those things, but I didn't have all the perks that other lawyers had to require because they couldn't do their own typing, and they couldn't uh, manage that part of it. Now, was it difficult for you to go into your own practice, and that's why you went with a law firm, or is that usually the road that you follow? Oh, no, I think that as for a beginner to go into your own practice, is uh, very difficult and probably not even advisable. You need seasoning, you need experience, and God knows you're not in a position to support yourself with your own mm -hmm. practice. You haven't built anything. Nearly all of them go with law firms or go with larger institutions, become assistant DAs, all the things we know about with lawyers. Uh, in my particular case, the people who took me seriously and eventually offered me a job are those people who needed my background or could use my background and expertise in the entertainment industry. That law firm handled Foot Cone and Belding, the advertising agency, and this was during the period when advertising agencies controlled television, or at least were one of the controlling factors mm -hmm. and were very active in it. It was my very first experience with television. It was totally as a lawyer. Other than that, I knew the stage. But I went from there back, in a sense, to the theater because I went to work for the Theater Guild, which was, of course, a very prestigious and substantial organization in the legitimate theater. And I worked there. As a lawyer? Well, I worked there in part as a lawyer, but I segued in part to uh, the improvisation of of television programming, because right. the Theater Guild, which then produced the United States Steel Hour for television, also um, advised, consulted on programming for an infinitesimally small network called the ABC, the American Broadcasting Company in those days. It was brand new and very small. So you started to work for ABC? Not until years later. There were many years after that because I really was working in the theater at that stage of the game. And, <clears throat> and did the things one does, uh, you know, I married, I had children, I retired at that stage to raise the children while they were small uh, for a period of time. And my husband, who had had nothing to do with the theater prior to our marriage, found himself very interested in it and started producing <laughs> and financing roles begin reverse. In a sense, except that I always kept a, a very strong advisory position. I did the script reading, and I selected plays uh, to be, you know, to work on, and I worked with him very actively until, in essence, I came out of retirement. The children got a little older, they went to school, and I started work in production. Now, would you like to mention three or four names, because I know they're very prestigious of the shows that you did? Well, um, as a matter of fact, uh, my husband was listed as co-producer of J.B. J.B. is Archibald MacLeish's mm -hmm. first play, and it won the Pulitzer Prize, and it was really a surprise hit, you know, and a very, very substantial one. Still the most important play we've ever been involved with. Uh, he was uh, a producer with the drop of a hat on the producers. And he went on from that. He had others. Now, remember, I was very actively mm -hmm. involved with him in the choice of these plays. We had an investment syndicate in those days. Uh, people who wanted to invest in the theater, you know, would come together. We handled those investments. And uh, it was the heyday, a very prosperous period for the theater. And it meant that there was a lot of activity. Now, you, let me jump Eventually, yes, I produced with him. I co-produced right. Bob and Ray, the two and only, and uh, acted as a producer in all senses, of course. And then you came to Warner's, did you not? That is a good bit later, as a matter of fact. What brought you to Warner's? Well, what brought me to Warner's was ABC and my first exposure to television, my first real exposure. Theater came on hard times. It was very hard to raise money for additional plays then, and I went out looking for an honest job. <laughs> uh, 
or one that was not as erratic as the production matter and not as wholly dependent, say, upon being able to raise the financing for another play. And got a job as a program attorney at ABC. I went back to law, and I was now uh, drafting contracts and working for ABC. I loved it. I loved working for the network. And as a matter of fact, as part of that experience, was exposed to a whole series of different things because ABC did more than just its television things. I produced or co-produced or helped produce a boys' circus for ABC. It was one of the things that they had mm -hmm. thought they would uh, get on. I had to do with the acquisition of theatrical properties for them. I worked for ABC for seven years and uh, as a lawyer, and as that other word of art that you hear all the time with respect to entertainment companies, a business affairs executive. Business affairs being the, the area that covers the negotiation of terms for all the deals that are made by producing companies, by networks, by just about any entertainment organization I can think of. I have to jump because we are running out of time. It's Sorry? So, it's so fascinating. No. I would like to know about your years at Warner's and about you becoming a uh, Women in Film president. Huh? I was working at ABC. We can do this very quickly. I came to Los Angeles alone, left my family behind for a period of a few months in until in New York. It was a traumatic period because I was here in Los Angeles living in the lap of luxury and dismally unhappy <laughs> because the family wasn't with me. The dogs, the bicycles, the children, all of the paraphernalia of life were back in New York. They joined me after a few months once we had a house and things could be established. But um, Women in Film was a tiny organization at that stage. It had been formed as a group of 12 women. It had gotten to a stage where it had 300 women. It has, of course, something like 1,600 members now. But um, that first meeting was a wonderful one that I was invited to attend. There were a whole group of my peers there. There were women doing all kinds of things in film and television. And uh, an enormous community of interest. I was very happy to get to know them and to be there. I'm going to take a sip of water. <coughs> Excuse me, sinusitis. At <laughs> any rate. That was my exposure to women in film. And a year or two later, I was asked to run for the, the board of directors. I did so. I was active and enjoyed working with people and tried my damnedest. The organization struggled, as all new young organizations must. And some years later, found myself absolutely by accident, it seems to me, elected president of the organization. So I was president at that time. Warner Brothers came about because I had been with ABC for seven years. I was a vice president. I had worked my way up through the myriad levels of executive, um, you know, line up there. And I was offered a job as vice president of business affairs at Warner Brothers and their television, Warner Brothers Television. And I had always wanted to work very directly in a studio in a production capacity and to be the business affairs for an organization that was producing actively all the time was a wonderful experience. I was very happy to go there. And I was there with Warner Brothers for about five years. Why didn't you become deals. president of the company? I, I keep so. wondering. I think they were very short-sighted. I would have made a wonderful president of the company. No. Suddenly you find yourself no longer with Warner and you decide to embark in private? Yes, there was more that had occurred. I was with Fox Broadcasting Company, which is, of course, the new small Fox network for a period of time. But somewhere along here, I decided it was time to use my expertise, all of the information and all of the experience and all of the knowledge that I had acquired about the industry as an individual for hire for anybody who came in the door and wanted to deal with these companies. Mm -hmm. If you had a deal to make with Warner Brothers, I was a very good person to have. I knew a lot about the way Warner Brothers ran the company. The I same see. goes for ABC and the other networks. I see. Do you enjoy being in, in private practice? 
Yes, but it's a struggle. It is not easy. I enjoy it because of the variety, because of the contact with uh, clients, uh, because they are a motley crew. They do all kinds of things, and they're very varied. And I get impassioned about whatever it is that they're at and try to help. Uh, do you still hope to become a producer for Fledge? No, I don't think I'll ever go back to producing. Really? Really, I don't think so at all. Producing, in my view, is, of course, essentially, most of all, a selling job. You get a vision. You yes. have a, a view of this project that you're putting together. And you must sell it. You must find a way for it to get to the outside world. That selling is an extraordinarily difficult proposition. Jonna, we have just about one minute left. Would you like to say something specifically to either the young people who are struggling, thinking they can't do it, or to the parents or to the educators, actually? All right. One thing, the view, the entertainment industry, it is an industry. It has a wide variety of occupations and skills and needs within that industry. So that there are, in the entertainment industry, of course, lawyers, expert about the industry, accountants, expert about the industry, makeup people, um, editors, all the people who work in the industry. But there is a wide variety of those business and professional skills that are utilized in it. It's another aspect. Okay. We have to wrap up. Thank you for being with us today. And remember, keep watching us because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Till next time.